Uh, well, for all of you who do or do not know, who may have made, seen me in the Boston or LA store, my name's Oliver Mack. I'm one of the co-founders of Bodega. I'm here with Noah Murphy Reinhardt's Nike Sustainable Design Lead, AKA Mr. Space Hippie himself, AKA Trash Man. You may know him as uh, part of the Future Farmers Collective uh, who do art installations, uh, or you might've seen him sailing around in his wooden boat around SF or Portland. Um, we're here to talk about the, the new project and the new design philosophy that he birthed with his team, uh, the Space Hippie. Yes, indeed, that's pretty good. I guess this is like, that's my, that's my whole life. There we go, it's perfect. So I wanted to uh, start with just the idea of uh, Space Hippie is trash transformed. What does that actually mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, really the big thing for us with trying to create a collection that got to this new level of sustainability um, was reducing carbon emissions. And it took a while for us to figure out what that would be and when we landed on this idea that materials that were at the end of their life that were destined for the waste bin were kind of the most abundant resource we had we had to say like let's use those but let's do as little as possible to turn them into a shoe what's it going to take um let's add as little heat let's add as little energy but let's start with waste and then let's let's make that into nike like real amazing nike product uh and that was this journey of transformation and there was all kinds of things that went into that, different technical innovations, uh, different design choices, but ultimately it just came down to like, use the things that are there uh, and do as little as you can to turn them into something new. Yeah, it's incredible. I'd see, I really like how you and the team approached the design problem of trying to create the, the lowest carbon footprint uh, sneaker that's ever been made and I believe you guys were successful in that right uh, Nike's uh, been on the forefront of s sustainability for a really long time you had uh, projects like trash talk sneakers back in 08 made from leather scraps but that was just the uppers uh, flying it is an innovation that's been around well almost a decade and it's producing started off producing 60% less waste and now uh, now the space hippie is different because you looked at all of the parts yeah, yeah. This was a really like, you know, you, you mentioned some of the products that have come before, right? We had a ton of things that inspired us looking back at Nike's catalog, looking at the heritage, uh, using Flynade in the shoes. Um, so it, it kind of, it set a pretty high bar for us to get over with these. Uh, but what we knew we had to do was, yeah, like you said, look at every single part of the shoe and really shift from thinking just about um, one element to everything back into the, you know, all the processes used in the shoe. Like when we heat press things, when we mold things, each one of those has an energy input and we wanted to consider all of those. So, you know, we went into a pretty deep life cycle analysis on all of these parts. And sometimes that literally means like taking alligator clips and hooking them up to the machine and seeing how much energy it's drawing when you're gonna mold uh, the bottom of the shoe. And, every single part of the shoe went through that kind of analysis. And so that's where we get to determining the actual carbon emission score. So the, the O4, uh, that one has the lowest and that is about 3.7 kilograms of carbon per pair. Uh, and you know, so that's, that's awesome. We're really proud of that number. Um, but it's like, that's just the beginning, right? Like we can't think of this as like, you know, sustainability isn't saying, well, okay, we've gotten to 3.7 and we're just gonna stay there. We're going to like sustain that, right? We have to get to where there's no negative impact. That's the idea of like move to zero, like no, no negative impact on the world for making product. But then we actually have to go even beyond that, right? We have to be thinking about transforming the making of things to being something that also makes the world better. And all right, that's a far out there future, but that's what our innovation team is all about. It's like, what, what will it take to get there? And let's start, let's start figuring it out. So Space Hippie and this idea of low carbon is just this first step on the way there. And Space Hippie also kind of encapsulate what you were, what your design team was also thinking of as like a framework. Say I was trapped on Mars, like the Andy Weir novel, The Martian. Um, yeah. I would only have the materials to, that I brought with me or the materials on 
Mars to create whatever I needed. And I think that uh, I read somewhere that that was also your part of your design ethos. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was this crazy coincidence as we were looking back at that movie, um, you know, the character in the movie is actually wearing a pair of free fly knits. And those were like the previous best carbon score because they're such a minimal shoe. It was, a, it was this perfect moment. Um, but that, yeah, that idea, it just kind of, uh, it became the world that we did all of the design inside. We, we uh, had a moment with the brainstorm where we were putting all these materials together and the name came out of that, you know, just as people were like shouting things out, taping materials together, thinking about this kind of um, just scrappy reconstruction moment. And this idea of the space hippie uh, came out of that. So then what we did was to say like, let's really carry that all the way through. Let's be sure that there's this tension between high technology, you know, like what Nike's really known for on the innovation side, um, but with this redefinition of what it means to use that, what it means to change the culture around sustainability and like let that tension between those two things inform the design throughout. So yeah, we, we really use that to just guide the process all the way through. Yeah, and it seems like even <clears throat> more constraints on already a difficult design problem because you're adding on top of it the idea of we're not gonna use any new, we're not gonna create any new materials. We're gonna look at how our materials are produced, where the waste is, and turn those into something like the space waste yarn offers, right? So that's, uh, yeah. the offers, how are, how, where, where did you source like the materials just for the offers in, in your facility or in the design space? Yeah, so the, um, the yarn is one of the parts that's made actually from trash that's out there in the world. Uh, so this came from t-shirts. So basically old t-shirts that have been discarded. We collected those uh, here in the US actually. And then those are blended with recycled plastic bottles and textile scraps from the factory. So just you know the offcuts of producing big rolls of fabric. And so we took all of that stuff and shredded it together. So that's kind of like waste that's out there in the world. And it's really like textile waste from fashion is one of the most abundant things that's out there. So like, let's find a way to use that. Uh, but then in the crater foam and the, uh, the Zoom X scrap, those came directly from the factory where we're making the shoes. So you literally are taking that scrap from one production line, bring it over here, shred it up, bring it over here and push it into the space if you shoes. Um, so those were like, again, that, that kind of fun moment of taking the most high tech foams that Nike was doing and then contrasting it with like old t-shirts and like, let's bring those kinds of things together make something out of it. Yeah, and it's really incredibly successful because say you have something like, <clears throat> Excuse me. You said you have something like the um, the, the outers, which uh, crater foam. So that's that was created by by putting old rubber into into a grinder. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So we really like. Let's see. The cleanest one I got here. <laughs> so you know when you see all of the speckles in here, this is the rubber that's usually the outsole of the shoe. And whenever you press those parts, it's literally uh, like a waffle press. So there's a, always a little bit of rubber that squeezes out around the sides. And that's the flashing. It gets peeled away. And we took that, we put it through a grinder, and you get these small chunks. And we took that, you know, rubber chunk, basically, and compounded it in with the foam. And so then when you take those and you inject them into the mold, you just get this texture naturally out of that. And each part's a little different. You know, all these little blisters and cracks and craters, they're different on every shoe that comes out. And as soon as we saw that stuff, we were like, oh, this is crater foam. Like that's, it's just made its name right out of the, right out of the material. And then, so you have that, and then you also recycled uh, Zoom X into the midsoles. And that technology is most famous for, you know, it's what, Elliot Kachoge wore when he broke the two hour marathon barrier. It's like the most comfortable midsole out there with energy return properties that science is still trying to figure out. So how do you, I mean, that, so you got those two elements playing together and it's not only is it functional, but it's actually probably the most comfortable lifestyle shoe that you guys have produced in a while. I really, when we picked up some of the very first 
recycled Zoom X parts. They were so light. Uh, it was like, felt like you could tie a balloon onto these shoes and they would just float away. Um, part of the innovation challenge with these was actually figuring out how to also get it to survive. Um, because that Zoom X foam, it's really, um, if you, you know, if you shred it on the pavement, it'll get torn up really quick. So the crater foam was this way of creating an envelope around it to protect it um, and give you the traction and durability, but then give as much of that soft Zoom X on the inside as you could. Uh, yeah, it was a really like, like that was a great breakthrough moment. We had gone through a, a minute in there where we thought we weren't gonna be able to use the Zoom X because it was so, uh, because it was so light. It wasn't, you know, just like that, it wasn't durable enough. Uh, and so the, the crater foam really became the like, the way to carry it all the way through. And I think there was an interview with uh, one of your co-designers, Haley Toll, and she, she said yeah. that, she referenced that uh, Bill Bowerman was actually the original space hippie, and the outsole of the crater form was actually inspired by the waffle. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, so I was talking about that waffle. You know, it's, there's always these elements that you've got to draw from in Nike, like the DNA, the, the design history, the cultural history of Nike is just so rich. It's like, it's a wonderful place to be a designer because there's all of these things that you're getting to pull from. Um, you know, the history and the community, it's just, it's, it's fantastic. So what we did was we took this really classic waffle pattern and you know, that is, that's what came out of that first waffle press moment when Bill Bowerman put this like rubber mixture into a waffle in his kitchen uh, got yelled at for destroying the waffle maker that was supposed to be for breakfast and, uh, you know, pressed this stuff. So we took that and we just kind of like let it get warped and wavy and have both that original kind of waffle vibe, but a little bit of this sense of just like play and taking this idea of sustainability and just like, let's have a lot of fun with it. Well, I also want to shout out the the, the process as far as, Another key designer on your team, um, James Zormier. Uh, he, yeah, I see him in, in a lot of videos waving a waving a drill around and uh, just really chopping things apart, pushing the design, the materials, and the um, the machines you use to create. Oh, there he is! Looking yes, at the here's the phone. That's the crew. <laughs> so, yes. At what point? Uh, how 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 do you start the process of? getting things to a point where you feel like you should start making a prototype? What is the design process for you, Noah? Yeah, this, this shoe was really important that it, and actually the collection, right? I mean, we never we didn't wind up with one shoe and there was a whole bunch of reasons for that in the, in the design itself. But ultimately this shoe had to start with an idea and everything about the collection had to then be about communicating that idea. Uh, so it was, you know, it started with carbon reduction, like that's the thing, let's reduce carbon emissions. But the, you know, the minute we went beyond just that first inspiration, uh, it was clear that it needed to be more than that, right? Like people connect with Nike product because it's culturally relevant, because it's performance relevant. And that's what pulls people in. So the whole ethos of Space Hippie and the design process was, are we taking this inspiration of next level sustainability and are we having fun with it? So each step along the way was like, okay, has this gotten too heavy? Has this taking itself a little too seriously? Like, are we being true to the science, but at the same time, uh, allowing that to just bring out like the best in us, the positivity in us and tackle this problem in, in that way. So that was the really amazing thing about working with this team is that each step along the way, we would just trade the shoes around and kind of like, okay, you know, does this make us smile? Does it make us laugh? Uh, and it was a really, it was a very prototype and physical process. It's why we wound up with these three and then eventually four shoes um, because we could see how much the materials could do. You know, we started off with the, with the midsole, but then as we're building on top of it, each shoe had its own vibe. And so we started to push that to the edges, making the O1 really lightweight and kind of like zero gravity running. Uh, and then the O2 is like recovery, just kind of hanging out in the biodome and relaxing. And then the O3 
is this like actually get out and explore the surface of Mars kind of thing. And so each one we wanted to have this vibe that would push further to the edge. And uh, yeah, that kind of just kept that, kept the story going and kept us inspired throughout the whole process. And it seems like, well, I think what people should take away from this is it's not just a collection. You created a design toolbox for, that could be used across other collections, across other product categories. So you're kind of also influencing the whole direction of, the, of Nike as a brand. Yeah, it was really, it was really key that this not be something that was just about this one release of, of product. It had to really be um, opening up the aperture. And that was something that John Hoke had said was like, you know, let's like widen our view of what performance materials are and bring, you know, trash into that conversation. Let's figure out how you can take that and like make almost any Nike shoe out of these materials. Uh, and so, yeah, we right away started collaborating with the different teams, women's sportswear, um, and working through how these tools could go into other types of shoes. That's great. And uh, well, maybe we could see Space Yarn in apparel too, possibly? Yeah. And there's uh, on, on sneakers, there's a t-shirt that's in there. So we took the same yarn and made a t-shirt out of it. And we'll just have to see what else we can get going. Maybe mock neck turtlenecks so you could hang a gold chain off of, possibly. I don't know. I don't want to overstep my bounds in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> you got any good ideas. Bring them in. I, I usually send them daily to your uh, info <laughs> at email, but I never get a response. Um, oh, I have a question about the, just the prototyping process. So how, yeah. many, how many iterations do you think you, you, you went through to get something that was a usable product? Yeah, uh, we have, I mean, we have really hundreds of prototypes. This is a good, so this is where the O3 wound up, right? And uh, as raw as this feels, you know, there was a stage where it was just like a sock glued onto some tooling. Um, and, you know, we were, we were thinking like, okay, you know, maybe this, and every time you would make a prototype, we'd try to figure out the carbon score. And so each one had its own, had its own kind of measurement, but you know, it's constantly changing and evolving. And here we were just really trying to figure out like, where should we put the fast fit system? Like, does this live on top? Um, does that give you kind of the best action? And these all actually worked, but you know, they're just totally wrong. We would just put these together by hand. Um, each shoe had maybe 40 prototypes or so, something like that, that we went through. So by the time we got done with this whole thing, yeah, we just had like, you know, we had a couple of hundred total prototypes just lying around. They're filling up an entire room on campus right now. We gotta do something with them. Well, should you recycle those prototypes to lower the carbon footprint? Or <laughs> yes. you come by and take one off your hands, I don't know, it would probably, raise the carbon footprint because I'm across the country. I don't know. It's a, as long as you bicycle over, everything's going to be fine. That's oh, it. man. Just take your time. My, my calves are going to be huge after this trip. They're already pretty big, actually. I, I bike every day. Um, actually, a lot of your crew bikes every day in the rain, probably. Oh, um, yes, definitely, definitely. And that, that whole philosophy of just everything you do, every, every part of the process, including even how you get to work as being sustainable is reflected in, in even your packaging materials. I noticed that you guys use a vegetable based ink on the box. The box is totally different. It could be used as a shipping uh, box for it. Are there any, any other elements of the shoe that we miss that uh, are kind of a small little win as far as innovation towards more sustainability? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, you know, we were talking about the fast fit system that's in the O3. And one of the things that's really unique about this uh, is that we used the very first version of that system that came out. Uh, and it's kind of, it's actually stamped on the, what we call the saddle here, where it says fast fit 1.0. We're constantly evolving that mechanism and trying to make it smaller and lighter and easier to manufacture. And by the time these shoes were in development, uh, Nike had actually moved on to Fast Fit 
Um, but what we found was that there was a, you know, several thousand of the FastFit 1.0 system that were still laying around in the factory. They were just a little, you know, produced a few too many. And so we actually went back and redesigned the kind of the core inside the shoe to be able to reuse those FastFit 1.0s that were laying around. So it's a part of the shoe you're never going to see. It's buried in there. But it was really this moment of saying, hey, like if we're going to be true to this idea of using waste and really, you know, reusing what's there already, let's just not leave those things sitting on the factory floor to get thrown away. Let's redesign the inside of the shoe to use what's left over already in the factory. So it was a really like, it was a fun moment. It was stressful because we were way into the process. Um, but again, it was one of those good things of saying like, there's no reason to let this innovation go to waste. Yeah, it seems like it, it fits in with, I read somewhere that your, your motto as a designer is start where you are, use what you've got. So the okay. Space Hippie project is entirely, it seems like your design philosophy encapsulated in a set of materials, in a set of uh, manufacturing uh, processes, and finally, in a desirable piece of art that people are just, well, everyone's camping out for, or not camping out for, entering raffles for. I know, we're all just doing this, we're all just doing this online. I mean, I think the thing that was so amazing about involving that, like that design philosophy really came, um, I mean, out of just my own life and approach to design, but then also when we, brought this team together to say like, what is it that we're, that we're going to do? So often we're used to saying, Hey, we have to, let's wait for this big technical breakthrough. And when we all sat down and looked at what we had, we said, you know what, we can actually do something amazing with what's here right now. There's no reason to wait. And I think that's just, it's super key as uh, like the core message of space. It is like, there's no reason for us to wait for, I don't know, carbon sequestration or some other big scientific breakthrough to start making a difference now, right? I mean, the same is true in economic life, in political life and social life, all of these things. It's like, we, we are where we are today and that's the moment to start making change. And that's really what we wanted to do with the shoes. Let's just like start now. Yeah, I think that's an incredible message in general. And um, it, it comes across uh, the, the, the project is so DIY feeling and it seems so effective as a, as from a design standpoint, all the way through a, you know, just a desirable consumable, but it's also sustainable and it has, a, has all these uh, other elements to it that leads other people to think a different way. And I think that's why this is probably the first time I've ever spent time to interview someone who created a sneaker, because it's not just a sneaker, it's like the design philosophy is something that resonates with me. And the, all the elements that went into it are just like so concise and it really builds the design story. So I, I haven't seen any other footwear projects that were so complete and, and so thorough and effective. So I, I, hats off to you and your team on creating one of the best releases of the year, other than all the bodega collabs that are coming out, you know. Which are, you know, just super fantastic. <laughs> Which we'll send you some, of course. And I, I wanted to thank you hey. for your time. This is, uh, it's, it's been great to learn more from you about design as a, I dabble a little bit, but I've never really gotten into the process and learning about what you do is really inspiring. Hey, absolutely. No, thank you so much for taking the time. And yeah, I mean, I think it was, you know, it's perfect to give the shout out to the team. Definitely Haley, James, uh, but also some of the people outside of Nike who inspired us. You know, we worked with Phil and on thinking about some of the early ideas and philosophies around this um, and all the folks who kind of made it come to life in the factory all around the world. Um, it takes a lot of folks to take like a picture and a dream like this and turn it into something real. Yeah, and that's, uh, it's the culmination of a lot of work and a lot of people trying to make a better future. And that's, I think that's the best part about this project. So thank you for, uh, I guess, spending time with us. And I thank you for the Space Hippie dream, the idea. So the thing that's going to inspire the next Noah Murphy, Ryan Hertz, to make the next generation of things. Let's make it happen. All right. Peace, Noah. Thanks again. Sweet.